All right, welcome to this month uh, edition of the market update for Los Angeles and the nation. We're going to go over some quick brief numbers, take a nice overview of the nation uh, after its wonderful birthday on July 4th. And then we are going to dive into LA's numbers. In between, we're going to stack in some unemployment, uh, some mortgage rates, some foreclosures and forbearances. We're going to stack a bunch in here in a very short amount of time. So we're going to move as quickly as we can. It's a lot of information. Let's jump in. All right, to begin, we can see here on this map of the United States that is color coded that most of the seller traffic across the U.S. is relatively weak, weak at best. Uh, I, I find it funny that that uh, the National Association of Realtors decided to call California's seller traffic as stable. I would call it un I, I would call it weak. Uh, we are still at extreme lows of inventory and we just don't have any. And this will be evident in the numbers as we start to go through things. On the buyer traffic side, we are seeing very strong, robust buyer traffic. This is across the United States. This typically reflects around single family homes as well as some of the other product types. But this is mostly single family homes. Please keep that in mind. In this Wild West environment, buyers are doing anything they can to stand out. And more and more, all cash offers do just that. And we, that can mean the difference between getting that dream home or winding up empty-handed again. Yes, all cash offers are making a difference right now. People are being very aggressive. They're finding ways to purchase homes right now. Is not necessarily true you need all cash. However, showing strength in your down payment definitely helps in this type of environment and especially in California. So if you're going FHA, uh, I don't know what to tell you. If you're putting 20% down and showing you have more to go, you're in a good solid spot. So I would not say that it's only all cash offers that are getting through, although that does help. As we can see, the inventory, the months of inventory of homes for sale for the last 12 months, uh, nationwide, we're still at lows at uh, 2.4 months available inventory in April. The year-over-year -year house appreciation for March, this is for the nation, the Federal Housing Finance Agency price index 13.9, CoreLogic at 11.3, S&P Case-Shiller at 13.2. The home price forecast for the remainder of 2021, everyone is still in line. There is an average of 8.2% increase. However, uh, I think that we're going to continue to see double digit gains, uh, partly due to this map right here, which shows price appreciation across the country year to date, year over year, uh, by quarter as 12.6% with the mountain standard time being the highest at 15.7%. This is not going to slow down. This is due to inventory, and we will discuss more about this shortly. If inventory increases slowly, house prices will continue to rise rapidly. And if inventory increases sharply, house price growth will slow. This is Bill McBride from Calculated Risk. I agree with him that even if inventory continually, continues to rise gradually, we're still going to see increases well into 2021 and 2022. Uh, this is just not going to slow down. Uh, this is due to high demand, low supply, and a lot of worthy buyers out there. So it's going to continue. Let's talk a second about how home affordability. Now. Housing affordability on a year-over-year -year basis declined in March for the first time since January 2019, ending a more than two-year streak of rising affordability. House buying power is likely to remain robust in the months to come, but affordability trends will likely hinge on changes in the nominal house price appreciation. This is Mark Fleming. We've quoted him before, he's chief economist at First American. I tend to agree with where his head's at. We're still at an extreme affordability. However, 
pricing is moving far enough and fast enough that it should slow down some. This is a housing affordability index, 1990 to today. You can see that, yes, housing affordability was at lows and it's increased dramatically to make it things less affordable. However, we're still below the distressed years for the most part, we're in line with them. Uh, again, this is price moving relatively quickly and uh, recent reports that I've seen is suggesting that builders are going to try and catch up. They're going to try and increase the construction, which generally means that they're going to also build at the lower price point, whereas most of the demand is happening. That said, the percent of median income needed to purchase the median price home is still only 14.4% nationwide. It's not true in Los Angeles, I know, but nationwide, this is the case. So it's still very affordable compared to, you know, 1985 to 2000 and 2006, which was one of the peaks of the market prior to the Great Recession. Contrary to popular belief, owning one's home is frequently more affordable than renting. It is cheaper to buy a home than it is to rent in two-thirds of American counties. Let's take a quick moment and look at the median asking rent from 1990 until 2020. You can see it's increased steadily and rapidly over the past 20-30 years. This is pretty aggressive and it's not going to slow down. There are reasons why this holds true. We'll talk about that briefly in a moment. We need to stop seeing housing as a reward for financial success and instead see it as a critical tool that can facilitate financial success. Affordable home ownership is not the capstone of economic well-being. It is the cornerstone. So what we're talking about here is that we need to change the viewpoint and get more homeowners into homes because it helps them financially over time. It fixes their rental costs or their housing costs, and in addition, creates wealth over time through forced savings, appreciation, and tax incentives. It's worth it. We need to keep this in mind and keep this going forward. This particular chart, though, is interesting because it shows that there are at least 17.8 million homes with at least 50% equity. That accounts for 31.9% of residential properties out there. And then 38% of all homes total are owned free and clear. This is a healthy place to be. This is great news for the US and for the homeowners. It establishes that there is security in the marketplace. Should something go wrong, people are not worried about losing their homes. It's extremely important. But let's check out some top investment financial advice from the financial institutions real fast because that's what we do here. Home buyers' interest rates are still historically low, though they are inching up. Home prices have spiked during the last six to nine months, but we don't expect them to fall soon, and we believe they are more likely to keep rising. Let's jump ahead. But the previous bubble was fueled by speculative buying, which we do not think is the case today. What is the point here? There's no speculative buying going on. These are homeowners who are going to live in their homes in, for a substantial amount of time. All right, let's take a look at another one. At the same time, supply is unusually tight with available homes for sale at record lows. Double-digit price gains are rationing the supply. That's Merrill Lynch. Here we have Goldman Sachs citing, strong demand for housing looks sustainable. Even before the pandemic, demographic tailwinds and historically low mortgage rates had pushed demand to high levels. Consumer surveys indicate that household buying intentions are now the highest in 20 years. As a result, the model projects double digit price gains both this year and next year. It's Goldman Sachs. Last one. Unlike 15 years ago, the euphoria in today's home prices come down to the simple logic of supply and demand. Blah, 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 
Higher interest rates and post-pandemic moves could likely slow the pace of appreciation, but the upward trajectory remains very much on course. So what is America's best choice of long-term investment? Real estate. That's right. It is incentivized. It is perfect for controlling costs, hedges against inflation. It fits in all of the check boxes. Stocks come in next. Gold come in in the in-between. Savings accounts, which don't pay anything, come in behind that. And bonds, which are paying even less, come in behind that. The 41% choosing real estate is the highest selecting of any of the five investment options in the 11 years Gallup poll has asked this question. So what's going to happen with, re with interest rates? Well, this is a great question. As you can see, mortgage rates have been at historic lows. Uh, this is well below what it was in 2006-2007. Uh, I'm myself remembering that period. They have been sustained at a lower rate. Will they stay there? Likely not. The question is, where are they going to go to? But right now they're at 2.99%. Some people are still managing to squeak out a little bit lower, but that depends on the deal. So when we look at the 30, the 10 year uh, treasury note on a weekly chart, we can see that it's been bouncing around. It took a little bit of a fall. This is what mortgage rates are based on and this is the treasury department that tip in the fed that typically does their bond buying and to help stimulate or control the marketplace it did spike up today it's not evident on this chart this chart is a couple days old when i made the slides uh, however the overall trend right now is still down so we are expecting for treasuries or bond prices to fall that means that interest rates rise. They're inverse of each other. Price is inverse from yield. Quick note. When we look at the monthly chart, we can see some potential places that it might go to uh, could theoretically drop down by another full 10 points. We'll see. Uh, time will tell if this is true or not, but these are the potential happenings that could happen. Or it could skyrocket out for you know, even lower interest rates, which I'm not sure would be really good for the economy at this point. I think it might overheat it a little bit uh, too much. Economic principle number nine, prices rise when the government prints too much money. So what does this have to do with interest rates in the bond market? Well, when the government goes on a printing spree, such as you know, more pandemic packages, more infrastructure projects, more of this, more of that. I think it's about six trillion they're trying to jam more, six trillion more they're trying to jam in this year. Um, it's going to cause bond prices to fall and interest rates to rise. That's the relative point of this. The reason why this happens is because bond traders don't like it when the bonds they're holding become worth less. This is an economic principle, and we cover it in a video that I am doing right now. It's called Inflation, uh, and I highly, highly recommend that everyone watch it. Here is the link to it. In the meantime, where are mortgage rates going? They are going upward in the near-term future. We can expect this probably by the end of the year and into the next year. This will also slow some of the buying power that buyers have and will also slow some of the price growth that we've been witnessing as well. Is it mean a, a, a massive crash is coming? No. And anyone who says so didn't look listen to everything I just said on the previous slides. So no, no crash. Not in housing. All right, unemployment. This is one of my favorite subjects. Why is it important to real estate and economics? It's simple. Jobs provide growth. Jobs provide spending. It provides the consumer base that creates the demand for the housing that we have and we need and we supply and we build. This in turn creates a major segment of the economy. So, jobs are hyper-local. Although we're doing very well in the United States overall, I wish we could say that we were doing better, but 
On the current national unemployment rate, we are at about 5.9%. This is fantastic. We've managed to gain a lot back that we lost during the pandemic, and this is largely due to states opening up and there being a reshuffling of uh, the masses throughout uh, the United States. People are moving to different states and different areas. In Los Angeles, we are still hitting at a pr sitting at a pretty high rate of 9.1%. We're still not getting open enough, and we're still not off the unemployment. And this is hurting the overall job growth that we should be experiencing right now uh, and could be detrimental to the Los Angeles economy in the near future for the next couple years as we continue to unwind this. So we will see. That said, I thought this was a fun little kind of graphic that I found on the Bureau of Labor Statistics. This graphic uh, shows the unemployment rates by state for the last 10 years. I selected three slides on this. The first one is April of 2020. This is when the pandemic hit and it demonstrates how drastically things shut down. This is a 9% and above uh, for most of the United States for their unemployment rate. Really devastating. This could have been hugely, hugely bad, like Great Depression and then some bad. But by January 2021, uh, things had opened up quite a bit and the unemployment numbers seemed to normalize quite a lot. However, you'll note many blue states are still in the blue to be expected. And last but not least, here we are in May of 2021, blue states still showing high unemployment, 9% uh, or more above. And part of that is, again, these states, while they may have been hit, they're not, they're not opening up and they've, uh, I, I hope that they have not done some serious damage to their economies in the process. So. We will see what happens. That's not um, so much a political statement as it is just an observation. So, foreclosures and forbearance. This is going to be the briefest section you've ever watched in your life. You ready? There's no distressed sales. Moving on. Sales. Okay, for Los Angeles County, we're going to go through these pretty quick. Single family active listings at 7,893 homes available for sale in Los Angeles County. That is a 29% decrease year over year, June to June. When we look at the pending sales, again, 29.5% decrease at 3,163 sales happening and pending currently. There is a reason for this because the closed sales skyrocketed by 51%. That means most people were closing on those pending sales, and that's at 4,984%. Uh, I'm sorry, 4,984 closed sales year over year compared to June of last year. Now, when we look at this, the active and closed sales on the same chart has it ever been closer together? It's still sitting very close. What does this mean? It means that we are selling what we get and most of what's not selling has something going on with it or is overpriced. Uh, that is generally what it, the case is. This is for single family. You should be able to sell your home in this type of environment. And if you're not, call me. I'll get it sold in three weeks. Trust me. Home prices. Single family home prices, the median sales price rose again by 28.9% year over year. This is a new high of 915,000 for a median home price in Los Angeles County. The average price per square foot still skyrocketing at $630 per square foot or 24% increase year over year. The single family average price per square foot as you can see, we did see some increases in the 5 million and above category. That's the top yellow line. The gray line that is below that is 2 million to 5 million sales price. It's still rising as well, sitting at the top end of its range. 
the uh, 1 million to 2 million range also rose, sitting at the top end of its range as a, at the average price per square foot. And the uh, entry level housing at a million or less continues its dominant rise above. And this is where the most action has been. This is where the most rise has been. This is what is driving that median price higher and higher and higher. It's not going to slow down as demand is continuing to aggressively see that 1 million and below price mark dominate the marketplace. Single family month supply. Well, we're still at 1.8 months of supply. That is a 43% decline from June of last year. Uh, that is still substantially lower. The shadow inventory, this is a little fun slide that I created. It basically just calculates how many properties withdrew, canceled, or expired in the marketplace in any given month, and then we stack that on top of the month's supply to come up with uh, the actual number of listings that probably did not, could sell, whether they want to or not. That number is 1,283 shadow listings with a 0.2 month supply on top. That puts us at about two months supply, which is still extremely low. This is another fun chart that I do. This demonstrates supply and demand at its finest. As you can see in the blue line, this is for sale. The closed is the bottom line in the gray, and the average price per square foot is the orange line. Each one of these demonstrates significantly the differences of supply and demand. We have really low supply, really high demand, and really high close rates, and average price per square foot skyrocketing. This is not rocket science. This is not a surprise. All right, let's move on to condo prices. Condo active listings. Uh, still declined year over year, although it's on an uptrend to 2,727. Uh, that's down 10% from last June. The pending sales are 725. That is a falling number as well at a 25 to 26% decline year over year. And the closed sales did increase. We are seeing that, which is a good sign, uh, at 1,000. 286, that is a 92% to 93% increase year over year. The median sales price rose dramatically to 593,000. That is a 22 to 23% increase year over year. The average price per square foot continues to trend higher at 14.2% increase from June of last year. That is at $579 per square foot. And last but not least, most of the condo prices are still trending in range. However, I'm going to make two caveats to that. The bottom range of $500,000 or less is still rising and rising aggressively. The $500,000 to $750,000 range has also been rising aggressively. These are really the two ranges that are driving price growth. I know some people are looking at the 1 million above and going, but look, but look, there's a spike. There's a spike. That price point tends to move all over the place. So I would not count on it sticking around at this price point. I would expect a pullback in that at some point. As far as the month's supply, that is two and a half months out there in the marketplace. That is a 34% decrease year over year. And what does all that mean? Well, it still means it's a great time to sell your condo. If you are thinking about selling, please give me a call. I'm happy to help you get the right pricing and get you an aggressive buyer within a short amount of time using fantastic marketing and aggressive pricing. Don't be afraid. There's still multiples in condos as well. All right, let's take a look at the lease for rent category. Now this is a fun little thing I started doing during the pandemic. It was really just to try and gauge, you know, how many leases, how did the rental supply increase over the course of the pandemic and were people coming back? It's a great question. There's not really a solid answer, but we did start at, um, you know, July 1st of last year with this. So it's been a full year and we can see that apartment uh, availability and overall lease and rental availability did increase and is now declining. 
So the question is, are these actually being filled or are they being withdrawn from the market? And this is an answer that I don't really have. My suspicion is that it's a little bit of both, that there's a little bit of filling up going on and there's probably more uh, units being taken out of the for rent category and potentially being sold off piecemeal, a little bit at a time. It's not necessarily a bad thing that actually compresses the overall apartment mix in Los Angeles a little bit while it's been pretty loose for about a year now. Um, but it also allows those people who can afford it, who were renters, to move up and buy condos, townhomes, and potentially single family houses as well, which is fantastic. Creating more homeowners creates more stability. That's how it goes. That said, that's it. If you have any questions, or you want me to look at something specific uh, in your neighborhood or your zip code, or if you're in Studio City, Beverly Hills, Hollywood Hills, I'm happy to take a look at it and just give you my two cents. I'll even make a little video for you. It'll be kind of fun. Uh, I look forward to seeing you on the next market update. And of course, watch out for the other programs that are coming up. The TNT inflation is out now, as well as the uh, next Walking in LA is coming out soon. Take care.